Before we start, let me explain to you one more HBS, usual HBS rule for case, case method discussion. One of the main things we tell our students when they start uh, the first day of school and all of that, the main thing we tell our students is to not look for what the company is like today. We have a lot of cases that were set in 1960 or something because they teach something fundamental about costing, accounting. That doesn't change, right? It's just because it's 2015 or 16, the basic principle of what is profit, what is loss does not change. So there are several cases that are uh, set long, a long time ago. Some of those companies are still alive. But, and if the decision is about something, we want, we tell the students not to let what actually happened affect their analysis. Because if you are in those shoes, remember the case, the case method is about getting you to think about what would you do in that situation if you are in those shoes. And if you are in those shoes, you don't have, you don't have an eye into the future about what will happen in the future. So to decide something based on what you know happened in the future is not the, is not the right thing. In the case method, as I mentioned on the first day, getting the right answer or being the one who suggested the thing that the company ended up doing, nothing great in that, right? Uh, because the company may be wrong, actually, in doing what they did, right? And the company may have been doing things wrong before that. And so, it's, that is not the thing. The thing is the, how you think about it. The thing is how you analyze what data are in your hand and how would you do that given that you have these data in your real life based on this case method, right? So that's the that's the way to think about it. So I want to, that's what, the reason I said this is because of course we all know factors. We are all here, some of us are suppliers and I don't know, everybody see, but some of us are suppliers uh, to Fab India, some, some of you have supplied in the past, have, have stopped supplying now, all, all sorts of things, all know that. We all know how many stores, this is public knowledge on their website, we all know how many stores they have today. Uh, we, we have been to the stores, we all have opinions about whether, the, whether this has worked, whether this has been a good expansion, a bad expansion. That is not the point, right? So again, I'm gonna this is I'm gonna read out what is written at the bottom of the first page. Just because uh, cases are not intended to serve as endorsements, sources of primary data, or illustrations of effective or ineffective management. This is just information meant as an aid. It is a teaching aid. It is a learning aid. It is meant to show you. If given a set of data, given a set of circumstances, what would you do? How would you think about it? So this is a this is just the setting. So try every time we are talking about this, please base your answer based on on the information in the case, uh, not in on or on information like if you have the, if you were working with them in 2006, please go ahead tell me tell us about it, tell us your experiences about that. That's perfectly okay because. We don't want to be the kind of people that, based on hindsight, decide uh, decide what to do. That's that's never going to help. This is not. It wouldn't be helpful to any of you to to do it that way. Right? So, if you have information from 2006, absolutely, which is not in the case, absolutely share it. Right? Everybody will benefit from it. Uh, but let, let's not let's forget that we are uh, talking about this in 2016 and that we know exactly their way. Okay. This is just the first, uh, this is just the first rule, and then to come back to come back to our session today. So this is a little bit difficult, right? In the morning we had such a clear set of very practical sessions, and now I'm going to make you sit back and think again about something in the, somewhat in that right? Yes, of course, there's some, there is reality here, there's facts and information here, but I'm going to make you step back and think about these things conceptually. And that's, uh, it's difficult, especially after lunch, on a, <laughs> on a warm day, uh, when you have been all so energized. I was, uh, but I think it's important, right? This is similar, let's think a bit about it this way. Again, let's go back to that model that I talked about of the three days and how we thought about what session we have. It's the, we're trying to go end to end in the value chain. So we started with the artisans and the product. 
on day one, we looked at operations on, on day two, on day three, we're looking at the market and, and what do you do as you're, as you're moving down those steps uh, in the market. And you know, people have brought this out before uh, today. Mika talked about how it's important to think of ourselves as doing three main things. We're doing design and research and uh, development, we are doing product development, we're doing production and we are going to sell to the market. And so we are at that point in the morning we looked at what it means practically to to do these things, to sell uh, to sell to customers all across the world, whether it's through the web or, uh, or through physical stores or to to hold, through wholesale, being a wholesaler. Uh, so to speak, we looked at all of these issues. Now let's step back and think about what, how will you think about this? So it's great to have the tools, but you know there were all these things that came out that you, you that if you were vigilant, you would be thinking about when everyone put a caveat. Well, it depends on what scale you want to reach. It depends on how much production you can do. Well, how do you decide? What does it, what does it mean? It depends, right? That's what the, the theory and the abstraction and the talking about. So think about it that way. That we've known, we have now looked at how to do things. Now let's think about how to think about what exactly to do. When we say it depends, well, it depends on what? It depends on how much scale you want to reach. Okay, fine. But then it can't just be that because if, if, if it was just that it depends on how much scale. So you have said, I want to reach. 10x what I am in, in the next one year, which is the kind of vision plans that Fabinia had. Fabinia is not master of the destiny. None of us are. There are all sorts of factors outside, inside that are going to affect all your best laid plans. And so how do we think about that is what the session is what the session is about. So before we start, I want you to take again, this is sort of like a reflection uh, moment almost, right? Take a moment. Okay, pull out your pen and paper and jot down some thoughts but answer two questions for me. Do you want to scale up and grow as a as a organization? What does scale mean to you? These are the two questions. Okay, I can see lots of people have uh, put down their pens and have uh, and are waiting to actually start the discussion, get into actually looking at that. So let's start with a quick show of hands. How many of you think if I ask you the question, can Fab India grow in 2006, given all the conditions at that time? Both uh, within Fab India, outside in the country. Can Fab India grow? How many of you will say yes? Remember again, you're thinking in terms of what it is in 2006. Okay, hands down. How many of you say no? They cannot grow at that time. Fantastic. Tell me why. Actually, it's interesting because I was in Tamilia in 2006, mm -hmm. and at that time, nobody within the organization believed that Tamilia would grow. Everyone within Tamilia didn't want it to grow because we couldn't pull the handloom and the handicraft sector with us. Mm -hmm. You know, the artisans were not ready for the growth. We didn't have those numbers of the artisans. Those rooms were not ready. The hands were not ready. So nobody believed this growth was possible. So the, the supply was still limited yes, at that point, right? Of 
Artisans are of uh, artisans, the raw material. So you were mainly constrained by what was the point. Uh, John Whistle, so William Whistle think that you know let's do it more fast quicker 
and we have to think of cost effectiveness also and competition is also increasing after liberalization mm -hmm. because they were initially fab india was the only brand who was uh, organizing uh, these things mm -hmm. but later on a lot of uh, multinational companies also introduced a lot of competition in the market so to position themselves in the cost also they have to think like how they can be crafty cost effective with the quality and uh, like with the good supply thing so you have this sort of foreign and domestic competition coming in that's making you worry because that again affects this part, right? Your operations, your ideology, your social mission. There was a bunch of yeses on this side on the environment being conducive. Who said yes? Why? Um, I think uh, in 2006, India was also a movement that consumers felt really proud to be associated with. There was strong sense of loyalty with the brand. Mm. And even with other players coming in, nobody else gave you that sense of uh, a social cause associated with the larger, you know, aspect of marketing and selling. Mm -hmm. So even then, despite the fact they had grown so much, I, I feel there was potential to grow even further to more sort of towns and, you know, uh, maybe tier 3 cities because there was a strong sense of identity that people had with the brand and what it stood for. So in that sense, I think the consumers definitely were a big cause of why Cavendia grew so fast despite the fact that, you know, they had maybe problems with their suppliers. It's because Consumers really, you know, sort of wanted what they were here offered. So you can move to two and three towns. Are you not worried about? Are you not worried about this competition that's coming in, the foreign and domestic competition? No, because there are you know, I, I mean, I, I would not go to an Adidas or any of the other brands mentioned to get ethnic wear. I would go to get a different type of, you know, either uh, workout clothes or whatever. Right. But whenever, you know, I mean, I'm talking about 2006, right? Right. If yes. I wanted, yeah, Indian ethnic wear, I, I mean, the first name and probably the only <laughs> name that would come up is Ab India. And not just for somebody in a, you know, mainstream city, but also in smaller towns who would actually, you know, find ways to source from Ab India. And of course, foreigners who would come to India. Ah. You know, so there was there, there, there was a very strong brand identity. Janet, no, actually, I'm one of those consumers because I I moved to Asia in 2005. Most of my family came from South India, yeah. and was yeah. the place. And I came from rural um, Dunmurdy, in Bangalore. In Bangalore, yes. And and so you you're you're sort of again, this is the complementary products thing, right? You're you're living in India. You're figuring this is the only place I can go to with some reliability, at least some reliability for. Uh, all of the things that I want, and even if the foreign brands are coming in, they're not going to be making uh, kurtas and saris and, uh, and patchwork and all of these things. They are going to be making your t-shirts and stuff. And yes, of course, people will have wardrobes that have both of those things, and that's going to happen. But that it's not going to end, it's, it's, or at least this is the opinion on this side that there is a complementarity to it. But also the competitor brands of Fabinia in. And therefore, this again ties back to you yes. can move to, yes. you don't have to just be limited. Right. Which is what Aruki was at the time, that they were mostly limited to Delhi, Bombay, I think in 2006, pretty much two or three places. So you can actually do that because it's sort of a reasonable price and an ethnic identity. Kind of thing in the, in the yes. And also, it was mentioned in the case that it was, there was a rise of 20% in the corporate salaries and the middle income salaries were also rising. So, the economy is booming. People the are moving and uh, they can afford uh, having their problems. So, the economy is definitely booming. And people are willing to buy. Yes. Yeah. And that's going to increase the price of things. That's going to change. I'm sorry, to be, uh, don't, please don't mind that I'm not calling you by your name. And the only reason for that is that this is being videotaped so that, and I don't want any of you to feel like I called out your name and then said, you said something that's, that's going on video. That's all. So now you'll be all anonymous because it's pretty much focused on me. And now I just made a face in the camera. So that's even better. Sorry, so, uh, you had your back. Yeah, we should also not forget this. The Fab India was competing in an altogether newer scenario, which was a retail segment. Mm -hmm. And that retail segment at that time, the FBI for first time opened in India. First, 
which allowed competitors like my friend was talking mm -hmm. like JC Penney's and Messi's were coming in India. But the only reason for this type of open in the Indian economy after a long time was because the consumption pattern in the Indian consumers have changed. And there was this report by AC Nielsen of 41 states mentioning that India was on the top of the spending pattern. Yeah. And that was the main source of confidence for Mr. Brussel taking the decision of expanding India to retail segment. Right. So, again, this is a, the economy is booming, but also specifically retail is not, it's not as though retail has been left behind and just manufacturing and so an export that's moving in local economy is, is also growing. Any, any other thing? There were lots of yes hands raised up. Yes. You know, there were clusters which were not actually uh, no way sort of linked to this kind of channel. Huh. So there were like clusters mm -hmm. supplying to traditional suppliers. Uh, and there were many. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. there was kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We were dealing with one cluster didn't know how to uh, penetrate into different market channels. So I think South India came at the right time to break those boundaries. Okay. So the traditional boundaries were broken uh, because then it's a, it's a new uh, So it's a, again, you started the process, as, as was pointed out, and you sort of set, set a system in place, you started to organize and manage these things. Why uh, organize and manage property? Let me ask one last question. Why though, like again, you know, so far they've had complementary products, they've had a clear identity, both in price, the type of product, and all of these things. What drives this whole thing? What is driving the entire product decision? What they decide to put in it, put in the stores, what they decide to produce, what is driving it? Well, I think I wanted to add something with the product, obviously, and, and yes, it's ethnic, but there is this edge, which I think came from the more global, especially the Hunan influence, and which like, set it apart from some of its competition. So there is a, it's kind of a it's, mix. It's, uh, it's a mix, mm -hmm. but it's a fusion that works, because, and it had input because um, this had been involved with Hunan and Fire from Macy, so I think that I have attention to detail. I see the strongest factor that led this was the Indian identity. Yeah. Almost everything that they did and uh, they made sure that everything had that handcrafted and very strongly associating mm -hmm. with the nation when Khadis had failed miserably. Ah, so there's again this is sort of linked to the design and the, the sense of presentation, the source of inspiration yeah. and having some mm -hmm. modernity. Indian consumer, the woman had changed herself. She herself, there was a huge demand for someone who wanted the ready made, who didn't have the time for, you know, go and buy material, tailor make it. They wanted this solution, easy solution. Yeah. So there was this ready market. The demand was there across cities. And a woman was moving from Delhi, Bangalore, Calcutta to Hyderabad. So the working woman was there. And so again, you can move to these other cities as well. The consumer is changing. That's I'm going to say design product. Just, I don't again want to put any value judgment on good, bad, whatever. There, there was a clear, so again, you you saw, and the case talks about it, but I know this from experience, right? You looked at people and said, yeah, that's their topic, yeah. They, it was very clear whether you liked it or not, that was, it was a very clear look that, that existed. So the design product, which was very Indian, there was this clear sort of Indian, uh, Indian look to it, which we have seen is driven partly by the fact that they are driving, they are getting sourcing from these uh, these sources, these suppliers. This is what John Russell wanted to do. So you have a very clear linkage here. I'm just my famous arrows are back. Uh, you have a very clear linkage here between what if, what the product is, what the motivation was for actually setting it up. So. You know when people talk about strategy and corporate strategy or, or any firm strategy, any organization strategy, they talk about, and we talked about this yesterday, the alignment, what is the goal, what is the motivation with which you started off and how, what does that actually mean in terms of the strategy and then in terms of how you actually execute it. What does it mean on the ground? You can start off with all this wonderful social mission and everything, 
and what does it mean when you translate it into operations? What is the structure? What is the what is the product you're going to actually have these kinds of situations? So here we are, and uh, I try to differentiate using uh, the Hawkeye among you will have noticed that some of these are all caps, and then some of these are in not in caps. These not in caps. Things. Again, I, pr I promised you to give you a way of thinking about, are we ready? Are we ready to do this, right? Internally, we may think we are, but externally, is the environment right? So we want to think about what are the pros and cons internally? What are the strengths and weaknesses we have internally? And what are the factors external to the <coughs> organization? that are going to influence. They could be positive, they could be negative. We have, here it sort of looks kind of skewed, right? We have a bunch of internal problems, but the external economy and the external uh, environment looks really good if you are thinking about uh, growing at this point as a retailer, as a, as a retailer with a very particular product and with some of the, some of the systems already in place. So you want to always do this kind of an analysis, right? Sit down, think, and I know, I know it's really boring to read census reports and uh, geo, how much is the GDP, what is the consumption index, and all of these things. But these are important factors. These are, you know, we were talking about uh, keeping, in, keeping in touch with market trends, and market trends are not just about what is the cut of the kurta, is it long or short, but also are people going more for, as, as we talked about earlier, is the coffee being grown on this side of the mountain or that side of the mountain. I have, it's horrible that I do this, but I do this whole thing of buying coffee from only one particular site in the US. And one of the things I like about it, apart from the good coffee, is that, where, where did it come? Is that they every time write me a little note, thank you Mukti for your order, enjoy your coffee. And it's such a silly thing, I know it's a marketing, uh, device, and I know, I know, I, I'm the one who tells people to do these things, but I look at it and I'm like, yes, they know me, they really like me, I want to buy it. This is also the, this is also the trends that you want to look for, so sociologically. So this fact about, you know, there are working women, uh, there's increasing numbers of working women, not just in the big cities, but also in the, in the next level cities, they, who don't have the time. This is not again just about the length of the kurta or uh, the side, type side of the neck or all of that, but about looking th at things at a much more deeper level. Like really trying to figure out in one. We're counting, right? <laughs> was, uh, anyway, we'll talk not on video, we'll talk about whatever what I was saying later. Um, that really try and understand what's happening in terms of the external uh, external factors and internal factors. Are you ready? And this is some of the things that, uh, that came up in the sense of given what you want to do, are you ready? And this is part of the reason why I wanted you to spend some time in the beginning thinking about what is the, what do you mean by scale? And what is it that you want to achieve, right? Fabulous definition of scale and growth of scale at least in the vision plan, so, so many numbers of stores, this much in revenue. Very, very, very clear. Now we have looked at whether they can grow. Given this speed and scale that they're trying to do, we have a, a sense of what is at stake, what are the issues that we should be thinking about internally, externally, going in, going in deeper. Now let's, let's look at how they should grow. There are a lot of yeses in this. So clearly you have some sense. Again, you are in 2006. Let me again put this down here. How, how should they go? Ideas. What are the things that you should be looking at? Yes. So um, if you look at the product categories and you know where the <coughs> 
garments is obviously the bulk of it. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, uh, there was a mention of uh, how uh, you know home furniture, for instance, had seen an increase. They have started, you know, uh, seeing more uh, sort of sales and demand for their furniture. Also, body care and their organic range. They said even if you know they could tap one percent of the potential, you know, target uh, yeah. population, they wouldn't be able to meet demand. So there's, you know, so these are opportunities. Basically, so product, product diversification. And product and diversification goes. Like <laughs> so basically, I mean, you know, they uh, right now seventy percent coming in garments. I, I, you know, they could maybe focus more on some their other products and increase the high for those. So organics and food, body yeah. care and furniture. Okay. So look at some of the products that have started doing, but yes. but sort of grow the pie. You were saying. <coughs> yeah. So basically, uh, when this. Uh, Liberalization came and like 2006 FDA was also open. So Tata and all these were the local competitors and uh, it is written that you know they, they penetrate into rural areas also mm -hmm. for stitchers. Mm -hmm. So I mean ultimately Fab India can get fabric from the rural areas and they get embroidered but stitching and all, all these things need to be done in the areas also. Yeah. So they were thinking competition is also there and supply side is also weaker. Yeah. So this is this is like we have proven ourselves but now how we can revenue, how we can raise our revenues and what are the options for that? So they thought product diversification. Organic was like there was no market player mm -hmm. in the organic sector who was doing and they were like a, there is a niche also. Who who is there? Who is there to buy all these kind of products? Yeah. So Pavilion thought that I have a retail chain. How I can expand that with more product range like orga uh, like uh, organic food, okay. body care, things and all. So both of you, would you these are these are products they are already just started making. Very small amounts but they have started making. So you already said you want them to go into tier 2 and tier 3 now. Yeah. So we are going to try and increase the sales of those products in tier 2 and tier 3. Now I suppose garments in tier 2 and tier 3 but some of these other more evolved products are evolved markets. Okay, so yeah. we are going to again try and uh, try and target yeah, exactly can, which they are already doing. In the right. same city they have different stores and having right. different products. But <coughs> what about you? You're going to try and go into other towns or in the same town increase the sales? I mean, uh, like from Fabinia's point of view, I will just try to capitalize on the existing strength of the city where I have already positioned and branded myself. So okay. I would just try to expand myself into that area. Like Bangalore is not a small city. Okay. So what I see, the people know Fabinia in Bangalore, but how we can increase stores and make the presence the most. Okay, so here you want to sort of the same thing, increase the number of stores. What else uh, can they do in, in this case? You've seen the growth from uh, 4, 5 to 5, 6. Mm -hmm. uh, what Fabinia should do now is, uh, they have seen that this is working. So they should go for uh, funding. Like Up till now they haven't received any funding from outside, they haven't looked for it. So they should go for uh, VC funding in huge manner and they should go global and compete with, give a tough competition to global brands instead of com competing them in domestic market only. So they should make a lot of small companies in house in the country mm -hmm. so that they can uh, decentralize the whole sourcing and uh, making uh, plan, warehousing plan. And then they should start creating stores all over the world on major cities of the world and they celebrate India worldwide, not mm -hmm. only. So you want to decentralize the supply, sourcing, production, and sourcing, and all supply. the operations, yes. right? Production, etc. In order to, uh, in order to uh, do this, so right, supply chain over here. Yes, artisan increase. Artisan output, it has to. Yes, yeah, should be already mentioned that mm -hmm. over here they are already facing the problem. So that becomes a bottleneck. Yes. So you have to train more artisans. You have to bring more uh, more artisans into the artisan into the Fab India fold. So mm -hmm. will that happen immediately? No. But say in two years of training, so in their growth plan they have to factor that in. Okay. That today the artisan may not be able to uh, give you know the productivity that they would want the artisan to give, mm -hmm. but you have to invest in them, you have to invest in them, start their training process, so in a matter of two years, or in a matter of three years, 
the artisans can scale up and and you know we are only talking about the other extreme mm -hmm. uh, where we are talking about the increase in the number of stores etc but what will they say if the artisans themselves are not being able to produce okay so training of the artisans and increasing the artisan footprint and bringing them into the fabric layer folds for that so so but we are going to take your current artisans current products and we are increase the production we know I am saying increase the number of artisans. You start training them. You okay. start like suppose uh, there is only Sarna, but you know then they take up also Seva. They also take up other five clusters, right. and 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 they start training them through their partners, of course, and whatever to they want. To do similar, to do similar products, whatever, 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 whatever they similar are. products or the products that they are thinking of. The uh, range will know. also increase. Okay, so the range will increase. So we have, have more products. products and yes. And you will have so with with some new uh, with some new like in, you have to increase the artisan footprint that okay. training part. So new products and skills need to be need to be actually uh, rather than uh, seeing themselves as sourcing products, they they need to place themselves as aggregators. Mm -hmm. So many uh, NGOs working all across the country, mm -hmm. working in the craft sector, they need to uh, they need to play a role of an aggregator rather than just Directly sourcing and what will that do? Uh, it will increase their supply base, so okay. they can go horizont, uh, I mean horizontally expand their supply base. Okay, so again, but for what they know how to do it, yes. which is garments and then maybe a few of the few of the other things. So the home furnishings, especially if they're going to get into organic and uh, body care. Okay, so again, this will aggregate and produce more. Forward so that you, you can actually get to this sort of speed and uh, speed and scale. So we'll come to you in a bit. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think uh, the other problem which they face is also the shortage of employees. So instead, like how they mentioned that they take on the visa of deathbeds, they may change the procedure and instead of only deathbeds, they should have a proper HR policy where they take qualified. So this is the ad hoc operations that people were worried about. Yeah. So they're informal, etc. So actually, to yeah, so actually formalize and be a little bit more structured so you can do it. Two more things. One is they need to get technology. Yeah. Because Not needed. They need. They are in 2006. Huh? They need <laughs> to get technology. Okay. You know, in it to enable this scaling up. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, what is the thing is that, you know, like products are coming into the warehouse, they're just going ad hoc. But you know there was a, there was there is a need for a system now to be put into place for to technology to map the movement of the products the ordering and the second thing is that there was now it is required that we put greater emphasis on design mm. because if we are going to scale up to that level we just can't just get anything so you know we need to now focus put into place a department or a think tank which is now going to exclusively design the products. So actually. Yeah, it, Again, invest more in design. So, do you envision this to be new kinds of products or, or just better old products? What are you thinking? Uh, better than existing products as well as create new from the existing raw materials. Okay. And, and sell to whom? Sell to the new consumers, consumers which customers. are there as well as your existing consumers because you want to, because you know, you're going to be not only increasing the number of stores in new cities, mm -hmm. but you're increasing the number of stores within a city, your scale, you have to increase your entire depth of line, the product line which you're giving to the consumer. Okay, so you want to go to both some new consumers. Yes. Yeah, so if a customer is coming to the store and likes handcrafted things and not, so they would probably want other products other than just garments. Okay. So, so other categories. So, so like uh, they mention all the kids' range. Furniture, wait, wait. <laughs> So again, increase the increase product. your share of uh, sales from the other within the store itself. Mm -hmm. Within one store itself, have these options around me. So change again your store uh, management so that you don't have this sort of dispersed all over the place. But people can come in and actually increase the size of the sales yes, for for billing for for billing that they do. Yes. Sorry. Oh, the segmentization of the of your 
clients like uh, earlier they, they it used to be for the women or mm -hmm. for the girls. Uh, mm -hmm. So like they started with the kids range, they started with the maternal uh, range. So mm -hmm. like how you can cater more of your target employee in yeah. a better way? Like how you can uh, increase your sales from your existing clients mm -hmm. by providing them more options. Mm -hmm. Do we think this is possible? We have grown yes. really really fast. Why do we think yeah. that? Now people are going to come and buy more from Fabitia when we have these other options coming in. Because there's a larger consumer base mm -hmm. which we've already decided. The economy has grown and the diversified uh, kinds of customers are there. Mm -hmm. So they would need to target and have products for a larger consumer base. So they need to know who they are and how they're different so that they can align to the designs required. Do we have any facts to help us Believe if we were Fab India in 2006, yes, we know the numbers, but population is growing all, all the time in India, that's fine. But do we really feel that there's an untapped customer or is the market saturated? Can, can we tell through any anything in the case? Is there anything the GDP was increasing, up to 3% increase to 8%. Okay. So that means uh, income was increasing. Secondly, they, 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 you know, they, they captured the untapped market in the way that they, they found that the type of products they actually want to deal in. So like the competition that they have were two types. So one was like either the brands which were there like, uh, you know, uh, like they were actually dealing in uh, like Adidas and all. So they were actually dealing in the fabrics and the, the, the type of products right. which, uh, which was a sort of like mix. Mm -hmm. You know, like Synthetic was also there. Yeah. And, all. and the other side, the, the actual uh, competition was either was with the government, uh, you know, owned organizations right. which were not so, uh, you know, good at that time. So yeah. probably they, they thought that this type of segment will be the best one to tap. And I think probably that worked for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe. But so. how big is that segment? Or have we exhausted it? Yes, definitely. They have a clear segment. What is the AC Wilson survey here? But are those all our customers? Do we have enough? That's the high spending dispension uh, 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 High income and ultra high income was in double digits. Right. So obviously, there would be able to But these are reasonably priced. You are really rich. You want to go buy a reasonably priced thing that everybody else is buying? But then combining the Indian identity and uh, that segment, that organized craft retail was not existent at that time. Okay. Any other thoughts? I mean, this is a full strategy, right? Get the customers to your mm -hmm. retail stores. They could also look at how can they reach out to more to customers. So, you know, go B2B, go wholesale, look at maybe, you know, their body care, can they sell it to hospitality chains, mm -hmm. things like that. They could, you know, start uh, looking at new consumer segments or customer segments and start reaching out to them directly. So, let's, let me now, you, again, you would have noticed. There's a, I'm trying to do something over there, right? So what I'm trying to do is a, is a classic way of thinking about growth. So people talk about this uh, in, in, in strategy all the time as, and you, I want you to put aside your, uh, what you already think of the word exploitation and think of it in the term, in terms of business strategy. So there are two ways to grow for any organization. One is to explore new opportunities, to go into new markets, go into new products. So that's basically what you end up seeing over here. And if you look at this axis as being product, and this as being the customer or the market, what you have is looking at whether this is old or new. That's why I had to rub things off and put them because I suddenly realized that my axis going wrong, whether this is old or new. So when you're exploring new opportunities, you're going to go either into new products or new customers or both. That little thing at the left, go global, get more design. Both new products and new customers, right? That's the exploration strategy. And it's risky, obviously. You don't know your new customer. You don't know whether you would have the competences to produce new products design that they're talking about. They need to bring in more design. Yes, they have some design already. They need to bring, will we be able to do it? We weren't, we weren't even great at doing it at the beginning. We sort of got a little bit lucky because we were the first. All these things can come into place. So it's a risky strategy. So a lot of firms go to thinking of exploiting. This is why I said don't think of it 
in the way that we tend to think of it in the social sector, but exploiting their current core competence. Right? So we know we can make these products well. We know we have a customer base, we have the sort of potential for, like within the same segment, potentially uh, meeting more, uh, more customers rather than even going outside of India or any such thing. So continue to exploit that until it gets saturated, until it becomes a sort of large scale thing, which is where you would be either in the, in the old product, old customer, or uh, kind of segment, right? Uh, and if you go into the old product, new customer, you're again sort of trying to explore new opportunities. But I want to ask you, can we afford to stay here? This is obviously the least risky strategy, right? The old product, old customer strategy. We know how to do it, we'll just do more of it in, in some ways. Can we do this? Is there really enough customer base here? It's not natural to stay there. Okay, so why? Growth is natural. Right. Otherwise, you stagnate and start declining, right? The minute we start growing, we start aging. And uh, we know where that is going. So, okay. Quantitatively, now we are Fab India for profit firm trying to make revenues. Do we have anything that we can say? Before this, like, before we talk about this, I have some metrics. I have one question on this. Matrix. Yeah, sure. If you make this matrix for Fab India, so in 2006, if we are talking in 2006, yes. so was Fab India aware of the segmentation of its customers in terms of old customers and old markets, mm -hmm. new customers and new markets. Sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That's if, if so, yes, okay. then only like we can start thinking on that because yes. once we made this matrix, I was just assuming that are we aware of these facts first, then only we can go about Yeah. So uh, let's, do a, let's do a quick show of hands. So, you know, Fab India was aware we had sort of uh, uh, validation from that. So all of you, you have a sense of who your current customer is, whether it's a wholesale or a retail customer. Do you agree? You have a sense of that? You have a sense of who you're not reaching, what's, what's sort of not there? All of us have sort of an intuitive sense, right? And, and that's how intuitively all of you have said that there are, uh, there's sort of a chance to actually go go globally, but, but there is a customer base. I want to put some numbers there. Can we believe that we can, even if, let's assume for a minute, that we can stay in that quadrant for some time, in that quadrant for some more time. Can we still grow? Do we have enough customers there? Are there any numbers in the case? Because I do want us to think start thinking, this goes back to our mindset discussion yesterday, no matter where we are in the legal status. Let's start to think in terms of customer orientation. Let's start to think in terms of production efficiency, trying to uh, trying to maximize that. Do we have numbers? Let, let me help you a little bit. Revenues of Fabinia, latest revenues? We have numbers? How much? 130 crores. Okay. I'm going to put it up here, right? Average bill? 1,250. If I assume each of this bill, each of these bills is raised by a new customer, a unique customer. We all know that's not true. Many of us have worked with the same so many times in, in one year. But let's assume that. So yearly revenue is this. This is your average bill. Approximately how many customers are visiting us? If we were Fab India every year. Okay, let me make it easier. Let's make this 1,300. How many customers are visiting us every year? One million. One million, yeah? Ten So, we have one million customers visiting us every year. How much is the, you were talking about the high net worth, etc. Just tell me middle class households. How many do we have at that time? I think it's page five. I think 38.2 million. 
that middle class households? Yes, especially middle class. <coughs> 56 million households, right? Yes. Just before that, yes. Yeah. So if we have 56 million households in the middle class, you remember again we are a reasonable price to the middle market brand. But we are, let's even say it's just the adults we're going to take. Four people in a household, which again is unrealistic, but let's take that four people that two adults, we, will, we still have 25 million, uh, right, to cover. And we have, we are still reaching just here. So, can we stay in this quadrant, you think? No? Yes. Yes, yes. no? Why yes? We, have, we haven't saturated at all. No, I mean, yes. We are we are sort of over here. If you're looking at your old customers, you're in one twenty-fifth of that of that entire segment with the products you have. And as I said, this is the least risky way of growing. You know this segment. You know how to make these things. We have problems internally, and we're going to discuss that. So we know how to make these things. So should we go and try to do this? Right now, no. what do we think? Raise your hand no. and toss. Yes. I think it should be a dual effort. First of all, secure what you have and meanwhile look for other stuff because that's going to eventually get saturated. Yeah. So make plans for your growth, but secure what you have. Maximize what you have and make plans for your Okay. So like uh, at that point, we, they were in uh, tier 1 cities. So I mean, tier 1 cities does not only have middle class. So tier two, tier three, and they have segmentized all these tiers, like you know which are the potentials, and all on that also they have uh, segmentized the products like premium, medium, and all these kind mm -hmm. of things. So the strategy was to reach more of these people because uh, having store two stores in Bangalore, having one store in Delhi, having two stores in Mumbai, will not you will not be able to reach to that 25 million people. So mm -hmm. to reach them, you have to expand yourself. So, so you want to again, this is the you want to do a dual effort. So yes, there will be some new, uh, there will be some new products you want to still do in the main yeah. cities because it need you need to get there at some point. But you want to take the same products and go to the new customer. Experimentation could be twenty percent, but it can't be hundred percent experimentation. But there is a potential. Why there is a spot? Why should not we? I mean, go to that area. Why should we shift away? What do we think? When there is, why should we not go? Why should we not go? There is a potential. Why should not we go? Why should we not go? What do you think? Why should we stand for the risk of losing what we already have while we're far away? It's a capital investment strategy. That's a capital investment strategy. Whereas maybe if we look at expanding their customer base with their existing, you know, portfolio of products, that that may have been easier. So it's all. I mean, so then it goes back to should they, you know, look at funding and things like that. And then secondly, uh, we are looking at the growth in the middle class income. Uh, one of the major components is corporate salaries, which is mostly based in tier 1 cities and un uh, as compared to tier 2 and tier 3. Mm -hmm. So, so again, uh, stay, uh, stay staying yeah. with that tier 1. So, that help any other ways to help uh, th think through this? Supply side is still a constraint. Mm -hmm. So, they have to really invest in their supply, uh, yeah. suppliers. Yeah. Uh, not only uh, having more supplier, but sharing the revenue. There is also a cost benefit ratio which is there. <laughs> 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 One may give you time, you know, like you know this time that you know that you will invest a little bit in new designs and if you continue to concentrate on your existing strength, you get the time to build up that asset. And secondly you still have a responsibility to your existing artisans to continue to give them work. They cannot suddenly be out of work and suddenly look at a new market or looking at a new product mix. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you give them time to scale up and uh, you continue to give them work. Or the existing stores also, you're continuing to give them uh, something. Some sales. Yeah, you yeah. can't sales. ignore them and suddenly just adopt a new baby and ignore the old one. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the value chain bottleneck is the biggest country, uh, constraint point in the segment first. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, tell me what that implies for you. That implies that first. Uh, stay there, stay where you are. Yes. Does this help you think about why you should, why you should at least for some time focus on what you're doing well? So this is again the exploiting your current core competences, right? You have, you have your supply chain, you have your products. You are 
clearly not reaching the full potential. Forget the high net worth individuals, leave them alone for now even if you wanted to. But you have you still have a huge part of the market that's untapped. So focus on that. If you wanted to do this dual effort, so, right? So let's say we are we are going to focus on this. We will uh, we'll take that for now. We, we, but we need to have an eye on the future. There is a possibility to to keep going going forward. What would you have to do to try and do both of these things? To still grow within the sector that you already are in, and then to think about the, the future. The uh, gap there is is the information time. You know you you're going to no, no, talk to them. You know that you're going to be uh, making that. Uh, uh, addressing that market mm -hmm. and you know that uh, you, it's very risky to do it suddenly. So my thing is that the incubation time is very significant here which is needed. Right. It's valuable. So this is the to so incubate. You, you can't just up and go. Yeah. You need to uh, keep developing. So especially the artisans would need to be, new artisan groups and all would need to be nurtured, brought into the frame, uh, train to give you the value that you are uh, known for. Yeah. So, you want to so that's the incubation time that this needs. It needs some time. Uh, yeah. To cover more market and to upscale, uh, you should be uh, you should be doing something which you are good at. You are good at making apparels and you have captured that market in premium. So. Send your team in other two tier, three tier cities. Try to understand the spending power, buying power, and their likes and dislikes and trends over there. Develop a different range which will go in that market, and then develop a power, ca capture that two tier, three tier market also with a parallel range. So that so will then cover, yes. You are good at that. Now you are diversifying in organics, but organics have got very less shelf life. Yeah. And how many people are you able to capture? You are able to capture only one person. Yeah. So you should be smart enough to do something which you are good at. Yeah. So keep doing what, so again I think we are getting to a consensus here, right? Keep focusing because that's your bread and butter. That's, <coughs> your, uh, that's the way you are going to keep your artisans in, in work. That's the way you are going to pay your salaries of the people, 650 employees that you already have. That's the way you sort of build the foundation for what might later be a beautiful glittering tower of, of Familia at, at some point. So we need this dual effort. We have, however, here talked about the constraints that they face. You know, some of these are internal. Most of these are internal. We've talked about what fund the funds they need, how the operations, because you can sort of, there's not much you can do on the external constraints that are there except to become better yourself and try to meet those head on. So if some of the things came out organically as you were talking that these are the things you need to do to address these constraints. But if you have to do this dual effort, first of all do you think the constraints become more severe, more difficult, and if so what should we do about it? I think it's um going to impact on the internal infrastructure and it could create a, a feeling of insecurity with the existing uh, workforce. So there needs to be input to human resources and also reassurance to the um, artisans that have learned. So it's not just training of artisans, but training and nurturing Let the insecure ones go away. Let them find a secure job where they feel all cut, you know, cuddly and warm. Well, but once you've built a, an institution where there is that kind of internal um, you know, celebration, actually, of what you're doing in terms of the way it um, works as a, as a store and as an experience, working there for also with the consumer, um, I think it's important. I, I, I know as a consumer when I went there, one of the reasons why I spent quite a lot of money there is because of the interaction I had with the people who were at the front of the house and you know, that kind of link actually to where my products came from. So um, 
I, and, and in order to keep on doing, you keep surviving in that area that you are doing well, you need to keep that strong, but perhaps bring in more or develop those and like, build your work. You don't think we can create that, recreate that in the new one, so let these people go, and then we'll recreate it in the new people we hire, because we'll select well at that time. I think you need to keep some of your beginnings, like you seed, your, your, your culture, if you like. To keep the keep the keep the process. There is a family kind of culture in craft organizations. So mm -hmm. I'm being general, mm -hmm. consciously, because uh, you know there is a, there is participation at both ends. Mm -hmm. The artisans, you know, you they are the ones who are actually providing the value to the work mm -hmm. that you are doing, and uh, you have a moral sort of obligation to. Make, the, make sure that you've taken on a responsibility willingly. Mm -hmm. You could have been sitting in, uh, you know, Adidas as a CEO when you've chosen to be here. Mm -hmm. And the emotional, uh, the social thread of the whole industry is such that you can't do this. Mm -hmm. It's so this goes back to the, there's, a, there's a culture, there's an experience that people are looking for in the stores that you've managed to create. Again, this is sort of self-reinforcing that is there. It brings us back to a little bit of Seva's case yesterday. We were talking about whether we can get professional managers to have this mentality to work with the artisans who live in far-flung areas, don't speak the same language, literally and figuratively and so forth. And you need that kind of a quite an understanding. Yes, going on, I mean, that resource becomes very critical when you're expanding in that nature because those values have also to be transferred from people who are Dealing with artisans and dealing with buyers, and so all your staff also has to be up to date with those values. Okay, so you're going to, uh, so you need to keep these people. You need to further nurture them. Is this all cheap? Yes. <laughs> so that hand shot up really I fast. The hand shot up because I think that you know Fabitia has never, or any of these firms or whatever NGOs or whatever. Nobody is really offering any kind of certification mm -hmm. as to how much of this they are actually doing in the back end. Creating that experience in the shop is pretty easy because you can replace the staff of the shop and train them really well. Uh, creating your labor base is also as to, as a professional, do I want to run my own NGO or cater to 30 of them? So one thing one attitude Fab India could have is that in, I've done this for this group and now this group is uh, you know, empowered enough to fight back or whatever and so now I'm going to go to another with a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's this big ethical conundrum, it's just a decision and in terms of the producers and the market, the story can be continued in a credible manner mm -hmm. because there is no certification involved mm -hmm. with or without this producer. So, so you actually don't think you need to nurture them and... No, you don't need to, it's a decision. What do we think? So as a result, what I think that uh, in 2006 now, uh, I'm not a craft organization anymore, I'm a retailer. Mm -hmm. So uh, the kind of uh, message I want to pass on to my customers, I can teach them to my, uh, what, what she was saying, I can teach them to my employees okay. and they can get trained like that to represent me. What I need to do right now is to strengthen my backend and I still second my point of decentralization to empower several organizations under you who can actually uh, adhere to your quality measures, which is which starts from the house of the producer. Right. So maybe you can you can work like I I I'll work like a retailer, but mm -hmm. I have certain quality measures, right. which is social measures, right. but not uh, typical product measures. So you are, in your view, the supply chain. My focus will always product, product and presentation. Yeah. Producers, I'll empower those organizations right. who will take care of the producers. Right. So you want to be able to decentralize and improve the number of artisans, improve quality, and you think that this is going to help you do both? Exactly, yeah. This kind of thing at a, at a later point of time, that this is where, is this all cheap and or easy? What do you think? People are shaking their heads, not willing to actually Yes. Okay, so I personally feel that uh, India, if I were at that point of time, I would have retained those employees, not just because of the uh, like 
ethical grounds, not just because of that, that is one of the reasons, but importantly because the retail market, the employees in the retail sector were not, it was not so organized that time, the retail sector, and so there were not so many professionals qualified to attend uh, this kind of an operation and this kind of uh, industry. And so uh, at least these employees had the essence of Fab India and we could upgrade their skills uh, and new fresh ones we had to train them as well. But importantly, they already carried the essence all through. So uh, it was like about retaining. So it's, it's in fact a, pro a professional business decision that you are taking. Forget the not forget, but while while the ethical part is great, it's in fact very good for the bottom line for what we want to actually achieve, which is to drill down into what we actually have for now and then prepare for the future and try to. And in fact, they might be the better trainers for the future employees that you that you get, and it might be actually cheaper. To do that, okay. Supply chain employees. We are now hiring new employees. We are investing in new products and design and everything. Where are the funds for this going to come from? If you were now, let's let's for a minute put your uh, put yourself in the shoes of a poor boy yesterday. It's two thousand and yeah, yeah. He talked about having there today. It's all very well. 2006, I've, I've spoken to William in those days. I've also spoken to funders in those days because once they found out that I had written the case, they all tried to get information from me. Uh, what do we think? Look, look at your uh, figures again. Look at all the things that you've pointed out as the problems and constraints. Excuse me. We needed to take jobs with you. You needed to focus on the current and grow at the same time. So we needed some kind of consistency and continuity also. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we needed funding. So maybe at this point, they should look at inclusive <coughs> maybe share funding for the artisans mm -hmm. to raise funding and to ensure they come along with you. And that's going to be slow though, right? We see funding of other than I I forget no. when it's funding. Uh, it's going to come nice and quick. What do you think? So, do you take both? Would you do both? What are you trying to do? A combination. A combination. And you think that's that's going to work? So, I mean, there is this uh, exhibit well, mm -hmm. which only shows that the track industry's restaurant was excellent when it came to expanding in you know, their already established markets. Mm -hmm. And also here, you know, one one and tier two. There was, you know, they, they, so it would be fairly unassuming very easy for them to raise funding at that point, given that, I mean, given the stable, but also given uh, the figures we discussed of how they, you know, their penetration amongst the target audience was still so largely untapped. And all of this. Exactly. So, you know, to an investor, it would seem like a scalable business, even given their, you know, very fast-paced growth, um, they definitely look to, and, and 2006 economy was still on the trajectory. You know, 2008 is peak, 2006, we were still a growing economy. Investors were looking at the Let's go to our friend from Fab India. <laughs> She's your investor. You're making a pitch to her. Tell her what you want to do in terms of how you're going to grow, what your ideology is, who are these people, what is your lead time for production, are you a healthy organization right now? The numbers are one thing. What's going on inside? Tell her. Make a pitch. <laughs> I would say that you know the growth that we've achieved in our existing stores. We, we have achieved sales. We are breaking even in every store. We are achieving profits in every store, which shows that we have been able to match whatever the growth that we want here. If you want 30 stores by this year, we have been able to cater to this demand. And we do have our systems, we are getting more people, we have set up these departments and systems are in place for us to move to the next vision, which is to move to 60 stores. So our existing sales are showing that we can do it and our stock levels in our inventory, in our warehouse is showing that yes, we, we are geared for this, we are moving step by step and we've not incurred a loss so far and all the stores so far are owned by us. We've never fractured, we've never laid it out, we've never it's not a franchise, we are all set Questions? So in terms of uh, cost of operations, I mean how operationally intensive is the 
sort of break up. So, I mean, you know, your sourcing is, is obviously a challenge, but other than that, how are you dense about cooperation? In terms of a drain on resources. Who would say it? The truth on that is so <laughs>
So you, you there's there's these trade-offs in it, and that's why uh, these kind of matrices are very popular with business people, right? You want it's very, it's impossible to really put yourself clearly in one quadrant or the other, but those are the trade-offs you often face. You can do this for you can do this for pretty much everything, right? Uh, in terms of in terms of any decision about the business, there's always going to be two things that need to be optimized, and you want to of course be in a sweet spot of high high on both things uh, as long as they're both positive. It is very difficult, and so that's that. So you could do all of that. You could do focus only on the premium products in in some cases, but then you will lose out on the old customer, old customer. And that's why it's, it's, it, it is sort of this graph. And, and this is where I just, to bring us back into how to work, use this session. The session is not about, again, <clears throat> trying to think, trying to find the answer for Pavilion. I'm happy to, as most of you know what they did at this point, right? They, they created community-owned companies, so this is the decentralizing of our things, where they tried to create regional centers. Some of the things that could be done, such as dyeing of, of fabric, it can be done at scale in large amounts. It doesn't have to be done by each artisan separately. That, that's sort of being done in these common community-owned companies. Those were the, that was the shareholder, the artisan uh, shareholders that they got in those. They sold shares in the company, in both the community-owned company, but also in Fabilia, the parent company, and they created an internal stock market so that people could trade these, these shares. It was difficult uh, because most people don't have this concept of a share. The kinds of people that they were using, that, that were their shareholders, don't have that concept. But this goes back to the 40 years that they spent building some trust, some reliability, some sort of connection with these artisans, it was probably easier than if I walked in and said, come on, give me your 100 rupees and I'll give you a share in this company that you've never heard of, that's probably much, much more difficult. So they did end up doing that because that was sort of the dilemma. You take new funding, uh, if you took new funding that came from uh, completely outside, so to speak, with very different parameters, again, Apurva talked about it. There'll be requirements placed. There's economists talk about there'll be no free lunch. And this is what it is. If you're getting money, you're giving up some share of your company and you're giving up some control over the operations because the investor wants invest his or her money back at some point. And so that was one of the one of the things they did. It did take outside funding, so it was a little bit of both. They took outside funding from a private equity firm, not a venture capital. We, we, I don't want to go into details about what distinguishes them. There's a slight distinction. Um, that was run by the former World Bank director, the director of the World Bank, which was, like a was firm on the story yesterday, a little bit more interested in impact investing. The thing I was going to say was that when, whenever typical funders came to me to ask, about Fab India, because they could see it was a growth story, right? Exactly to, to your point, it's, it's clear that the retail market is booming, the economy is booming, it's already proven itself. All the things were in place, and they would ask me, so what's going on? Do you think they need money? I'd say, yes, they need money. And then they would go and talk to Fab India. Fab India would basically tell them, we need money. We need you to put in money to the community on the companies. And they would step back. They would say, well, we don't, we don't know about those companies. We don't have any, like, who are these people? We, don't, we again, don't speak the same language, and so forth. And so they, it, was, it was impossible to get money from any of the traditional venture funding uh, sources that, that the company could have, uh, could have done. So ICICI Bank was another, uh, another funder that, tried to do, uh, that helped out with the artisans uh, the community of the companies through microfinance. And so there's a complex financing structure put in place in order to minimize the, minimize the impact on the things that they had done well. On, on the, and, and, I, and I'm choosing the word minimize for a reason, right? It, again, like I said, there are going to be trade-offs, but 
there's a way to minimize the bad parts of those trade-offs. And one has to think about it creatively. And one has to, again, going back to sort of yesterday's session, one has to think about the entire organization, the, sec the environment within which it is. So if you think back to yesterday's goals, context, goals, that it's exactly those things. Now we are sort of looking at what that means for trying to grow, for trying to increase the way, uh, increase the, the impact, both financial as well as social, that this organization can have, and using this sort of framework of the internal factors, external factors that you need to consider, you need to dig in deeper, you need to not just take the numbers and, and think about those, but think about what, because again, we, you know, the numbers, we have the numbers. To, to basically tell us, this is where you can keep growing, keep growing for a long, long time. But you need to think about the fact that this is also happening. And so we need to think about the future as well. You can't, it is true, it is not natural to just stay in this quadrant forever. Uh, you need to think about moving forward. This exploration, exploitation is another trade-off. You have to have that dual effort. And it made, this is all made much more difficult in all of the sectors that uh, that we operate, that the people in this room operate, and because of this dual thing. I, the other thing I want to my my dissertation was on entrepreneurship, and the title of it was uh, this old proverb of uh, from little acorns great oaks grow. Right? So all of us think now of Vapidia as a large organization that is and have various ways of thinking about it. But I can assure you they all face all of the problems that you might be thinking about now. Even though, because every, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not, nobody that becomes huge overnight. And at each stage, you're going to face these problems. And I wanted to, uh, and challenges and ways of thinking and, and trying to figure out the solution. And what I hope this will give you is A, let you uh, see how other organizations have dealt with it, give you some, give you some hope and inspiration and, and uh, fortitude that even something that is found in here today with 200 plus stores and so forth, uh, and, and you can see that they didn't actually reach that vision plan in time. They've now hit 200 stores, but 2008 was a huge financial crisis and we all know what happened then and so forth. So they didn't reach that third vision plan, but they've now reached uh, 200 stores. Even Fab India faces at some scale the same problems. You want to think about it not just again in funding, not just in impact, because you do have the situation of if you grow, the artisans will grow. And so you do you can't just take one side or the other, whether you're not for profit or for profit. I'm not even talking, none of the vision plans talk about profit. This is actually, many business professors will say this is a terrible idea to focus just on revenue because yes, of course I can increase revenue and uh, drive, drive losses also very high, right? But the pr plan didn't even talk about profit and yet you have this trade-off uh, that, that you have to face. And it's the same trade-off. So even if you are a not-for-profit, you want to increase the work you do at this end so that this end is also lifted up and these are the dilemmas you would face this is a way to think about it, and this is a way to, to start analyzing the situation so that you can start to arrive at some sort of a solution. It's not, it's not impossible, as again, the example shows, as the example of several suppliers to Fabinia has shown, it's, it's difficult. But then we never got to do this because this was going to be easy. So, thank you very much, and we'll break for a few minutes.